This week's episode is brought to you by Bureau Veritas. At Bureau Veritas, each and every member of the team is by your side to help you navigate your decarbonization journey. This is Green Seas, the podcast by Tradewinds about the environment and the business of the ocean. I'm Eric Priante Martin, and today we're going to explore the water crisis that slammed the Panama Canal. At the Panama Canal, it takes a lot of water to move ships through a system of locks that carry them from the Pacific to the Atlantic and vice versa. The figure amounts to 200,000 cubic meters for the transit of just one vessel. That's the equivalent of 80 Olympic swimming pools. And even though it's been Panama's annual rainy season for months, water is a commodity that's desperately lacking. And that rainy season is almost over. At Tradewinds, we've been reporting on a rainfall crisis that has led the Panama Canal Authority, the agency that runs the 100-year-old waterway, to restrict the number of ships that pass through it. Usually, 36 vessels transit the canal per day. Gradual reductions will bring that number from 25 today to 18 at the start of February. Additionally, the canal is only taking pre-booked vessels, and those slots have been auctioned off for millions of dollars. And as of the last update from left agencies, there are 147 vessels waiting for their turn to go through. While a water shortage this severe in what is supposed to be the rainy season is unprecedented, scientists say this is an example of the extremes that are consistent with the effects of climate change, as is the potential for too much rain in other years. Solving this problem is a complicated puzzle for the Panama Canal Authority. Eric Cordova is a hydrologist who is the head of the department that manages the canal water resources. And he told me that rainfall shortages in Panama have had a strong correlation with El Nino, a climate pattern that occasionally occurs in the Pacific and has a way of sending precipitation in a different direction than usual. By late September of last year, it was clear that El Nino was coming. Uh, We started uh, saving water. We started the water saving measures this year by January the 3rd. Uh, We we started to apply the use of the Neopanamax logs, water saving basin, and we started two uh, cross-fill procedures in the Panamax logs. In in this way, we we, uh, have achieved to save almost the 50% of the water that we used to use. And we were able to support 44 feet of uh, vessel draft uh, in the Gatun Lake. Because uh, the Gatun Lake is a freshwater lake. We rely on the the amount of precipitation. Uh, That's the only income or or inflow of of water uh, is only through the precipitation. The Panama Canal gets much of the water it needs from two lakes. The big one is called Gatun Lake, and ships actually cross this lake as part of their journey through the canal. A smaller one is Alajuela Lake, but there's a delicate balance involved. The canal is an important engine of Panama's economy. Direct revenue alone accounts for about 3% of the entire country's annual gross domestic product. And direct and indirect jobs make its contributions many times that percentage. But the two lakes are also a source of drinking water for the country. And they produce hydroelectric power. We have to, to balance and um, make forecast. We, we usually foresee the amount of precipitation in the near future. And we simulate. We have hydrologic models to try to find that amount of water and we have the the chance to allocate enough water to support all services uh, along the wet season and obviously the dry season. During the wet season, we store store water. Uh, We take advantage of the the water storage in the reservoirs uh, along the, the dry season. So that way, we always try to supply enough uh, water to all our services. At the end of the list, we have the hydropower plants. When we have excess of water, uh, we open the hydropower plant to to generate uh, electricity. When there's not enough rain, the hydroelectric plants are shut down. On the short term, in addition to the water-saving measures that the Canal Authority has ruled out, the agency is also working on a project that will move a filtration plant further away from lock entrances to make it easier to reduce the salinity of drinking water. 
And that's it. Uh, pray for more rain because we are almost at the end of the rainy season. We could receive rain uh, for the next two or three weeks only. After that, we're, we're expecting to start the, the dry season. Once the dry season starts, there's not much more that can be done. And the situation is expected to get worse in 2024, at least until the rainy season returns in May. It could take a month and a half of rainy season precipitation to start rolling back draft and transit restrictions. But even then, the Canal Authority might not be able to fill Gatun Lake to capacity like it did in last year's rainy season. There is short-term hope down the road, however. Cordova told me that El Nino typically lasts 15 months before it's followed by its sister, La Nina, which typically leads to above-average rainfall. Uh, we usually uh, we receive a, a La Nina, which is a, the contrary of, of El Nino with uh, excess of, of water which is good for us because we use uh, water, but sometimes it's too much water. And sometimes you, you have uh, problems with, with floods in the city and, and some other places. But uh, we are ready to, to manage flood conditions. We, we have spillways and people watching uh, the weather forecast in order to, to make decisions in advance. Let's say open gates, uh, for instance. But we know one thing, El Nino will return, and climate models tell us that it could come back with similar ferocity. The Panama Canal will need a long-term solution if it's to prevent this year's crisis from happening again. In fact, unions for the tug officers and pilots that guide ships through the canal have complained that the Panamanian government and lawmakers missed an opportunity to prevent this crisis. Panama's legislature, the National Assembly, passed a law more than two decades ago that called for building infrastructure that would give the canal access to another watershed, the Indio River. And although studies in 2003 backed that plan, it was rescinded in 2006. Gabriel Aleman is president of the Pilots' Union. He told me that Panama has a problem. Even when rainfall is below average in the wet season, it still rains, so people don't feel the dominoes falling towards a crisis. He said Panama is rich in watersheds, but the Panama Canal only has access to one. So we need the government to provide the canal with the amount of land that they need to make the new water shelf for supply the canal in the future. Once we have that, because Rio Indio, the one we want to use on the west side uh, of the country, they do have uh, plenty of water, plenty of water. That, that if we have made that five years ago, 10 years ago, we will not be talking uh, about of the crisis of water in this moment because we're going to be we will be able to use the water from Rio Indio to supply it for Gatun Lake. So yes, the climate change has been affected, but we knew it. We knew it in advance that that was going to happen. We knew in advance that the water was the the talon de Aquiles of the canal. That's Achilles' heel in Spanish. So we had to be prepared, and we we were not. The Panama Canal Authority does have a long-term solution in mind, and access to the Indio River watershed is part of it. Cordova said the agency has set up a new office with a $2 billion budget and is studying a variety of projects to meet the growing demand for water that is caused by a growing population and growing world trade, which leads to more ships in the canal. He told me that there's not one solution alone. The canal has a, a level of design. The canal is not designed for extreme conditions. Extreme conditions in terms of excess of water or extreme conditions in terms of a shortage of, of water. So we, we, have, we have to move to a lower uh, water conditions because this kind of shortage, water shortage, is not acceptable for, for our market. It's not acceptable. Maybe in years before or in the past, yeah, one, one year, two years, we can work with that. But at the level of business today, it's not acceptable uh, repeat the, this year again. The potential solutions do include connecting the Panama Canal to the Indio River, as the unions insist. But there's a problem. Panama's constitution gives the canal authority jurisdiction over just a particular part of the country, and the Indio River watershed is outside of those boundaries. Cordova told me that it will take approval from the government to move forward with several of the canal authority's proposed projects to improve the water situation. Panama's president has yet to act, although he has recently appointed a new water resources czar. Cordova acknowledged that the construction of a reservoir and a tunnel that would carry water from the Indio River would have environmental impacts. Every pro project has a, 
an impact. The, the, Canada, the Panama Canal, when it was built, had a huge environmental impact, but it, it, it depends. It depends uh, uh, how you plan the project, how you deal with the stakeholders, uh, how you mitigate the impacts. So it's a mix of interest and how the developer mitigate that uh, consequences uh, during the develop of the, the project. Cordova said the Canal Authority has made sure it has an impact on the country's drinking water supply. But to accomplish that, it's had to make decisions that impact vessel transits and canal revenue. I, I think that is a, it's a no-brainer decision. I think that because we have uh, tangible consequences right now. Thinking in the near future, uh, thinking uh, ahead, thinking in the the population, 2.5 million of people live around the, the Panama Canal uh, watershed. And I, I hopefully think that uh, this is a easy decision with a positive results in benefit uh, of the local population and in benefit in, in the uh, worldwide commerce. Here's more about the environment and the business of the ocean. Danilek, a company that makes hardware that measures vessel performance, has snapped up optimization software company Nautilus Labs, which uses artificial intelligence to reduce ships' fuel consumption and emissions. It's the second deal in recent weeks to combine a software platform with a company that provides the hardware to collect the data that makes optimization more powerful. Read about it at tradewindsnews.com. The Green Seas newsletter featured a special report by Tradewinds on shipping's upcoming entry into the EU emissions trading system. The report looked at the volatile pricing of carbon credits known as EU allowances and the bureaucratic hurdles to getting started with emissions trading. Get the newsletter in your inbox by signing up at tinyurl.com slash greenseas. Our colleagues at Recharge have reported that the ship that's been touted as the largest jack-up vessel for installing offshore wind turbines is struggling to keep up with the increasing size of the giant rotors. And Jantanul's Voltaire was built only a year ago. Read about it at rechargenews.com. Music for this episode is by Royalty Free Music on Pixabay.